Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum at Memorial. We are releasing this video on Friday, May 7th, so uh, 2021, so just a couple of days before Mother's Day. We're releasing it now so that uh, you guys get a warning that Mother's Day is coming up, so that you're not blindsided like I was last year. So, if you are a mother, uh, if you're married to a mother, uh, or if you have a mother, maybe, maybe pick up some flowers by Sunday. So, uh, this year, 2021, is the 113th Mother's Day that we've celebrated in this country. And how we celebrate Mother's Day has changed over the years. I don't know that there is a set way that we celebrate Mother's Day today, but we were going through some old uh, articles of the ship's newspaper, and it talked about how they celebrated uh, Mother's Day back during, uh, I think it was the 44th Mother's Day, and while they were off the coast of Korea. Uh, at that time, it was an all-male crew, and uh, the, the bulk of the crew were teenagers or early 20s. Uh, so none of them were mothers. All of them probably had mothers. At that time, it was common to celebrate Mother's Day with a religious service to pray for your mother uh, and to uh, wear carnations. In fact, the, the battleship handed out carnations uh, to the crew, you could get a red carnation if your mother was still living or a white carnation if she was not. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, I believe, why many of the uh, Mother's Day documentation in our collection uh, have flowers on them. So we wanted to shoot a video to remind you guys that Mother's Day is coming up by freaking flowers, uh, but also there isn't a whole heck of a lot to talk about vis-a-vis -vis Mother's Day uh, on the ship. A common uh, object in our collection is the letter home. So today we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that, the letters that the crew wrote home to their mothers, uh, and primarily the things that they didn't include in those letters. Be sure to let us know in the comment section below if we missed anything. Well, see, I, every every month my my my, wife, my mother used to get. I didn't have a girlfriend at the time, and my mother used to get a, a, a telegram that he, we're still listening to the MIA, but not closing the case. We're not closing the case on it. And uh, at the end of six and a half months, when when I got released, I noticed the division patch, and there was a friend of mine in that outfit. So I went and seen him, and he said, "I thought you were dead." So I let, read, let, wrote him a letter. He sent it to his, his girlfriend at home. The girlfriend took it to my mother and showed it to my mother. And my, and my mother noticed that I misspelled, oh, I used to misspell the one word all the time. And said, oh, my son is alive. Yeah, and then after that, you know, and, and that's the only way. They knew I was alive at six and a half months. So nowadays, it's pretty easy to get in touch with uh, your loved ones even if you're out at sea. It might not be as easy as when you're at home, but it's still significantly more doable than when the ship was in service. During much of the ship's career, the best way to get in contact with home was to write letters and wait until you're passing another ship going in the opposite direction and transfer your sack of mail to them. And uh, maybe they had a sack of mail transfer to you and wait for it to get to the destination and for your loved ones to write something in response. Uh, so it wasn't a quick process. I told him, he brought me down there and uh, on my rack, uh, when I opened it up, there was still a note from uh, my mother. So it was uh, really exciting. It was, uh, she had been dead years, old, I mean, a long, long time. So it was, uh, it was, it was exciting. However, um, you would include in these letters, and this is not something that millennials like me think about anymore. We don't write letters, uh, but in, in these letters, I know because I've read many of them in our collection, you tell your family, your mother, your significant others, uh, what, what's going on. But yeah, you just hang out, write letters to your families and friends. Uh, 
There are limitations to that, however. There are certain things that are classified that you're not allowed to include in letters. It's like wartime uh, letters tend to be screened to make sure you aren't writing in there that, hey, we're sailing to this point to launch a secret attack or uh, things like that. So that if something happens and that mail is intercepted, there's no usable intel in it. Uh, other things job related might be classified as well. We didn't have the internet, we didn't have our phones, we didn't have no outside contact of the world besides what they told us on the, on the news station. But the best time was when we got letters. And we knew when the helicopter landed, they had a big, these big orange mail sacks that come on board. We knew we had letters in those things. Are you the Marine that's assigned to guard the nuclear warheads that may or may not be on the ship? You probably can't mention that in your letter home. Do you work in the uh, specially compartmented information areas on the ship? like the uh, ship signal exploitation space, uh, where you're decoding Russian transmissions. You know, we probably can't say too much about that either. A lot of what uh, you don't want to tell your mother about, though, is the shenanigans you get up to as an 18-year-old kid away from home for the first time, who's just been given the bulk of their paycheck and turned loose in a foreign port, let's say, uh, the ship is uh, in the Philippines. Just come out of the Philippines. We had a heck of a party that night in uh, Turret One. I hope I don't get in trouble for this with anybody. But I know I had two pints of Philippine rum. That were, it'll, it'd probably take paint off the wall. And we had movies and we had, well, what we did was we locked up Turret One from below and they couldn't get in through the rear hatch, and we all sat down and partied and bullshit, and then the next morning everybody had to try and get up and get ready for the Bob Hope Show. Put his, they had his show right on top of Tour One. Maybe you didn't tell your mother about the woman in white uh, on that dirty brown river that uh, stood in the canoe that you would throw coins to. Maybe you don't tell your mother that uh, you took up smoking while you were on the ship. Maybe you don't tell your mother uh, the state of dress or undress of the dancers at the bar you went to. And hey, maybe you don't tell your mother that you spent a lot of your liberty at a bar instead of visiting local museums and theaters. Eight of us on liberty together, we had about 20 bucks combined. We had enough money to buy some food and go stay in a youth hostel. And then we were able to get a cab back in the morning. So, and we were wet because it was rainy. We had no changes of clothes. So that was kind of interesting. Maybe you don't tell your mother that the ship has a compartment on board specifically for treating venereal disease, or that you might have uh, lined up in that line once or twice while you were on the ship. You get guys coming in with venereal disease. When they would stop in port someplace in, a, in Subic Bay, Philippines. Right, or Yokosuka, Japan, and the different areas. And what would you and, and maybe you definitely don't tell your mother about the crossing the line ceremony the ship had when it passed the equator. Uh, for those of you who don't know, crossing the line uh, is a fairly old tradition uh, in which there is an amount of hazing that goes on when the ship crosses the equator. And there are similar ceremonies for if you uh, cross the international dateline, for if you cross into the Arctic Circle, uh, various other uh, significant maritime events. Pollywog is someone that's never been across the equator before. Shellback is someone that has been across the equator before. Uh, if you go across the equator, the shellbacks, which the, the people that have been across before, uh, get to just have their way with, <laughs> with the uh, Pollywogs. Uh, they had, uh, I think they're called shillelaghs, uh, lengths of hose, three inch hose that, uh, one end, or one end was, uh, wrapped up with tape to make a nice handle on it. And they used to soak, they soaked us down with water, and, uh, we would have to crawl from the front of the ship to the back of the ship, and there were poly or, uh, shellbacks on both sides of us. And each one of them would take a whack at us with uh, the fire hose. 
So I was hit on the back side. I was hit uh, on my back, up by the neck. I mean, I was just uh, kind of black and blue for a while. <laughs> then we went back to the, uh, there was something called the Royal Baby. Uh, that is the fattest shellback on the ship. And uh, he had a lot of axle grease. Uh, spread on his stomach, and we had to crawl up, up to him, and then he would grab our head and just grind it around in the axle grease in his stomach. And uh, then we went to the, uh, uh, there was a tank of water, a portable tank of water, uh, like you might see in somebody's backyard, a swimming pool, and uh, they had a tiltable chair and they would, they had this big syringe, and they squirted about seven or eight different types of oil in your mouth. So while you're trying to spit that out, they tilt you back into the pool of water, and there's all kinds of garbage and stuff sitting, laying on top of the water. So while you're trying to spit the oil out, the garbage is coming in your mm. mouth. <laughs> then you went to the... Uh, uh, the uh, food chute. Uh, it's food that they, it was garbage actually, uh, that they had kept in a nice warm place for uh, a few weeks. And then uh, they put that in, it was a little covered type deal. It, the covering was probably 12 inches, 18 inches high. And you had to crawl through that. And uh, if if somebody lost their cookies, you know, right in front of you, you had to crawl through theirs, too. I mean, it was just terrible. At the end of that, uh, you just took your clothes off and threw them overboard because there was n no saving them. I mean, the cr the clothes were just totally ruined. And they had a sh shower faci uh, facility up there. Right. So you could take a shower and rinse off. So for the crossing the line ceremony, you have polywogs who have never crossed the line before and are being hazed and the shellbacks who have done it before and get to do the hazing uh, and the ceremony has changed a fair amount uh, over the years and uh, by some metrics has become tamer in uh, in the present day Navy but uh, really it's pretty ridiculous on this ship the, uh, each division uh, elected a uh, a beauty contest contestant from their own division. Remember, the ship has an all-male crew. Uh, but they went to some pretty great extremes to get outfits together to compete in these beauty contests. Uh, there's a lot of stuff with shaving people's heads and smearing them with grease and having them crawl through uh, garbage and blasting them with fire hoses and some more traditional uh, hazing stuff where you just beat them with lengths of fire hose. But it's all good because the shellbacks were once polywogs who endured this and the polywogs going through this will come out the other end as shellbacks uh, who can then put their pants on the right way and, and join their uh, fellow shellbacks for the next initiation ceremony. And positions in this ceremony are not necessarily based on rank. If the captain is a polywog, they have to go through the hazing the same as anyone else. Uh, the, uh, the royal baby isn't picked according to rank. It's just the person with the biggest belly. And you're going to have to kiss the royal baby's belly. Uh, the royal barber is not actually the best barber on the ship's crew. King Neptune, I'm not sure how you pick who King Neptune is, but he presides over the entire ceremony, along with his royal court. Thank you guys for watching. Let us know in the comments section below if uh, there were some other, any other things you did in the military that you wouldn't write home to mom about. And make sure you get some flowers by Sunday. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. 
Uh, in fact, the donations we've gotten from private viewers like yourselves have allowed us to go from making one video a week to multiple videos a week. We really appreciate that, and if you'd like to continue to support us, there's a link in the uh, description below. Also remember to like, share, and subscribe so that you're notified when we're putting out all this new content. Thanks for watching. Pulling into Australia, we heard lots of stories about what it would be like when we got there. And um, senior folks above us said, you know, when you get there, there's going to be bags and bags of letters because the Australians love American sailors. They want to take you out to dinner. They want to meet you, take you to their house, their church, whatever, show you, show you the city. Um, so make sure to grab some letters. And when we pulled into the port in Sydney, Australia, and the Sydney Bridge and the Sydney Opera House, and we're in that harbor on this ship, and I first came up topside and looked out, there was thousands and thousands of small watercraft. Just that harbor was full of them. And it was party goers and sightseers and girls doing this and <laughs> unbelievable scene pulling into that harbor.